So hello everyone and welcome again to the Arctic Borders in a Global Context webinar. My name is Victoria Herman. I am the Managing Director of the Arctic Institute and one of the principal investigators for the Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network, which is a National Science Foundation network over the next three years where we bring together scholars, practitioners, storytellers, and decision makers together to discuss, learn, and act on Arctic migrations. Today, we have an incredible set of speakers for you. Uh, but before I introduce them, a few housekeeping rules. If you have not already done so, please mute yourself so that we can see our three speakers. As they are presenting their work today, you can put any questions you have in the chat box. We will be moving to an open question and answer session at the end of the session today. And I will be monitoring the chat throughout this webinar to take note of everyone's questions and to either ask them to our speakers if you are having difficulty with your internet connection or for you to come on and unmute yourself or come on video and ask yourself. Again, this webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it to YouTube later this week. So if you need to leave early, no worries. You can always catch whatever you missed at a later point. And finally, this is the last of our webinars in 2020, but we have an incredible uh, array of webinars that are already planned for 2021. Uh, and you can join us in those by joining the Research Coordination Network and making sure you get our once a month newsletter that lets you know all of the webinar happenings, but also uh, the in-person meetings that we will hopefully have in Anchorage, in Stockholm, and in Washington, DC uh, in the years to come. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand it off to our three speakers today, Dr. Heather Nickel, Dr. Karen Everett, and Dr. Andrew Chatter, who are going to share their findings from an upcoming book on Arctic borders in a global context. In this webinar, they will be asking each other questions and have a lively discussion about the historical definition of land and maritime borders, mostly in the North American context, as they relate to disputes, delineations, and possible challenges for border management in a climate-changed world. I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Nickel, to get us started. Um, but again, if you have any questions or technical difficulties. I will be watching the chat throughout this webinar, so please make sure to ask your questions there. Uh, let's give a virtual but silent round of applause to welcome Dr. Nickel to uh, our virtual stage. Up, and I think there you're... we're there. It just took a minute to unmute. Well, thank you very much, Victoria. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here today. I recognize some some uh, people, uh, some names, and um, you know what we may have to defer to you sometimes for answers. A few a few folks here may know a little bit more about it than we do, but that's just fine. The team today, uh, Andy Chater, Karen Everett, and myself, um, worked on a project, Borders and Globalization. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then I'm going to explain explain how this project came about and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Andy who's going to actually moderate a session and, and and with some curated questions to kind of bring out the points that we feel we want to get across today about the work that we've we've done over the last couple of years so this project uh, came from a borders and globalization uh, shirk network grant that was held by uh, the principal investigators were uh, Emmanuel Bernajali from University of Victoria uh, assisted by Victor Conrad from Carleton University. And it was an amazing um, 
project. Uh, and hopefully we'll be doing step two in a little while, but it was an amazing project to really try and understand worldwide the impact of globalization on borders. Uh, and it really comes out of the discussion about restructuring the state that we had, you know, several a decade or so ago when we started thinking about what was happening to the state under, under globalization, even earlier than that, I guess. Uh, you know, the hollowing out of the state, understanding uh, that uh, new uh, relationships were forming up, you know, transnational corporations, transnational agreements, transnational influences impacting what goes on in states, being actors within a state, and subnational actors or non state actors, that is, uh, um, agencies and actors who don't speak on behalf of the state but still had a voice were actually taking part in international relations and in decision making in other contexts and that left us to think about well what's happening to the border where's the border in all of this because if you remember back in 1990 it was the notion of a borderless world that the yeah, border was going so away <laughs> Kenichi Ome, um, you know, raised that issue. And there was a group of us even then that said, not so fast, uh, borders are here to stay. But how are they here to stay? And that's what we were looking at in, in uh, borders and globalization. So there were teams of different scholars that worked together all around North America, all around the world. And we had the, the fortunate, fortunately, we were selected to do the uh, North American Arctic. So we're looking at the North American Arctic, looking at really what impact, um, all of these changes to the organization of, 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 of global relations have had on borders, borderland functions, configuration. We, and we used what we call a borderland approach to explore this. And this was, again, set by the project that we were looking at four or five through four or five different lenses, government, uh, or governance, security, culture, history and sustainability. And mobility and trade and trade um, trade flows. What you know? What was happening? If we how can we understand borders through that lens? So I guess the only thing I'll say before I sort of close off and we start our main discussion is that it was a little difficult. I felt, I, and I guess all, all researchers feel this. And you know, in, but wait, my area, you know, it's different. How can I do this in my area? Don't we understand how exceptional it is? And I think we may pursue that question in a minute. But um, I, I would say that it was a challenge for us uh, because, of course, two things. Um, one is that as we'll talk about borders are a little newer and, and, and the colonial nature of borders are a little more raw, I would say, uh, in the North and in some other areas of, of certainly of North America, not to say they're not colonial borders there, but, and the second thing is it's incredibly difficult as we discovered, um, at least I did, I, I may, maybe it's just me, uh, to find a lot of good information. If you look at, at places like Stats Canada for, it's changing now, but for a very long time, you haven't had reporting on the territory, the territorial north. You've had reporting on provinces, and there are other layers you had to dig through and uh, to, to try and other filters to try and find information on on northern borders. So it's been a challenge, but I think we've uh, in our little book that we've produced that will hopefully um, we'll talk a little more about later come out next in the next year within 2021. Um, hopefully we'll um, put some of this to, to use and, and uh, um, but we're gonna give you a little sort of sample today of the sorts of issues that we're, we're talking about. So, so with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Andy Chater in, and uh, just to say that I, uh, we all work at different universities. So I'm at Trent University, director of the School of Study of Canada. Uh, Karen and Andy uh, are instructors and researchers uh, teaching and researching at different institutions. Uh, and I'm going to ask them also to introduce themselves um, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what they do. And then Andy, you'll um, take it away. Yeah, so uh, nice to see everybody virtually. So my name is, uh, is Andy Chater, and I'm an adjunct faculty member at uh, Brescia University College, which is in, in London, Ontario, Canada. Of course, the first London that comes to mind when you hear London, London, Ontario, Canada. And um, so my, my main area of research is Arctic governance. I've done a lot of work on the Arctic Council. And uh, yeah, so when, I was, when I'm looking at issues of borders, I'm often thinking about them in terms of, in terms of governance. I'll hand it over to Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Everett. I'm a postdoc at the University of Laval with the Canada Research Chair in Comparative Aboriginal Condition. I've done research on border management in the Canadian North 
and with my postdoc, I'm looking at um, economic uh, inequalities in the circumpolar Arctic. So thanks. Okay, great. So I have prepared uh, a bunch of questions that uh, should take us through all the major points in the book. So we'll see how we do. Um, so my, my first question, I'm gonna start with Heather, but uh, we'll all answer. And that is, in what ways are Northern borders in Canada and perhaps in North America overall uh, exceptional? Okay, well, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell you the ways they are, and then I'm gonna actually tell you a couple of different ways that they're not. But but let's start with, with the, uh, the exceptional area. And I sort of hinted on that. Um, a minute ago, you know, they're the last borders to be finalized, really, um, uh, major borders to be finalized uh, in North America. There were bits and pieces of the other borders uh, that had to be worked out, and there are still bits and pieces of other, of other borders in North America that have to be worked out. But, but really, they are the last to be finalized, um, certainly the land borders. And the maritime borders, and I prefer to call them boundaries, really, maritime boundaries aren't all uh, defined yet. There are some, you know, in the Bering Strait, there are, we just, uh, not long ago, the Lincoln Sea was resolved, but there are so many others that are not uh, well-defined yet. And that's a little bit exceptional too. Um, and of course, then that with maritime boundaries, I think Karen, you're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So uh, I'll just say that, you know, it also means there's a different, it's an inherently different role that, maritime boundaries play. They're a little bit different than land borders. Um, then I think the other thing too is that uh, in terms of border management, borders are exceptional in North America, uh, particularly in relation to uh, climate change uh, and particularly in relation to sort of a more dynamic, you know, the dynamic nature of change that's, that's happening. A little bit different from uh, say the Southern Canada border with between Canada and the US, uh, melting ice. And again, we'll get into that uh, changes the status or challenges status uh, of certain boundaries. And that's a little bit exceptional. You don't see that happening. Uh, and the can't, you know, uh, along the 49th parallel, you know, if it's a little drier in Alberta in one year, it doesn't doesn't change where the, the boundary goes, right? So, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I think one of the things is, another thing is that there's this, we'll get into this too, this is inherently a sense of this, these are inherently low risk border, land borders, certainly. Um, and to a large extent, um, there's, there is a sense that these are low-risk borders. And I might just say, for example, I was speaking with the uh, RCMP, their O division, some of their O division folks yesterday, uh, and they were talking about INETs, you know, integrated, uh, what are we, integrated national security enforcement teams. There aren't any in the North. They're managed out of the Vancouver, uh, out of Vancouver, I would think. Every other region in Canada has something dedicated and in major cities, but not the North. Uh, so there's a sense of a dis different kind of a risk uh, and a different way of managing. And then I guess finally, um, they are newer, they are raw, more colonial in the sense that um, we're still, well, the land claims process that's going on, but, but uh, it's just a very different context uh, in which uh, the international borders have been imposed. And generally speaking, they cut through uh, indigenous communities in, in um, they do everywhere in North America, but the intensity and the degree to which that happens in the North is different. Of course, I could say there's, um, there are also ways in which, you know, everything can be qualified. There are ways in which uh, these are situations that are manifest in every other border and, uh, you know, around the world um, in slightly different ways. And um, uh, the role and function of borders is similar. But um, let's just focus on the exceptionality for now. I'll add a couple of a couple of points and immediately betray my own question, which is two, I think, key features that are not particularly exceptional in the Arctic region. Um, the first is that, of course, the borders are fundamentally uh, colonial constructions that are that are in play today. Um, if we look at the indigenous peoples of the region, we look at the original inhabitants of the region, the borders that exist today, create divisions, national divisions uh, that were not meaningful, meaningful historically. Um, you know, if we look at the Inuit, for example, uh, the, the borders that exist between Greenland and uh, Nunavut or Canada are not borders that were that were important historically. Um, 
in addition to, to that, uh, I think that, and Heather, Heather alluded to this point, we often uh, read about particularly maritime boundary disputes as being a, a source of conflict in the, in the Arctic region and an issue of concern. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit about that later, but I think that one thing that's notable about borders in, in Canada and in the Arctic, uh, North American Arctic more generally, is how, how well managed they are. Uh, what governance has uh, occurred has been cooperative, has been in compliance and in a framework of international law. And where there have been boundary issues or boundary disputes, the approach has been uh, an international legal approach as opposed to a approach of posturing or escalation. So I think those are two, those are two noteworthy features. Great. Um, so for me, um, I like to think about how northern borders are different uh, from borders in the south. And so when we think of um, the North American uh, north, uh, we see that there's a land border between Yukon, BC and Alaska, but that's it. Um, the borders are primarily maritime and this is quite different than Can uh, Canada's southern borders. And this alone changes how we think of cross-border flows uh, when we compare um, these types of flows in the north and the south. And it also, uh, um, it, it will also have impacts for when we're looking at policies and national policies and how they get applied to the north. Uh, Cause you may need to make some changes or tweaks or adjust for the different um, conditions in the north. Um, so there's, there's a few management issues there, so thanks. Okay, great. So now I have a question for Heather that's not at all a giant question that I'm sure you'll be able to answer in two to three minutes, which is uh, to start at the beginning. How do we arrive at the borders that we have in the North American Arctic today? Who drew these borders? Okay, that's, I love this question because, you know, I think of it like a weather map. Um, that's the best way to think of it. You know, you had the front rolling in from France and the front rolling in from, from uh, the UK. You got the front rolling in from, you know, uh, the US. You got the front rolling in with vitreous bearing from Russia. And, um, you know, it, these borders start as, imagine, you know, sort of imaginations when, um, and they start about imaginations of, of, of terra nullius, you know, the notion that there's this land with nobody home and uh, that great power can go and claim land uh, uh, if, if it's perceived it doesn't belong to anybody. And of course, I mean, that's a consistent thread in the Arctic is that um, indigenous peoples lived there, but, you know, at low levels and just weren't seen. So in a sense, the first, uh, you know, everyone from um, um, Frobisher who went through, you know, 1507 uh, to, to Bering to uh, everyone up to the Franklin expedition, knew there were indigenous peoples there but but it really wasn't seen as a, as an occupied territory in the sense that that uh, european powers were were used to so so the fronts roll in you know the russians uh, i think well just to stop for a second i think that what also is interesting is that much of the arctic uh the north american arctic from um alaska through the canadian arctic to greenland was all the a project for private companies they were with trading companies, the Greenlandic or the the, the yeah the Greenlandic. Um, I want to make sure I get the the name right, but it was the uh, the Royal Trading you know trading company, the Hudson's Bay Company, and then a, a, a series of different um, but very similar and related Russian fur trading countries companies that moved in. Uh, the Russians, of course, were the first in many ways to settle uh, to the Aleut and, and area and and Kodak Kodiak Island, uh, and they kind of you know, vaguely sort of pushed through the claim to the point that there was a, in 1925, the current uh, placing of the Yukon Alaska border was sort of defined by the Russo American, uh, by Russo American Treaty. Um, but you know, after that, uh, it really was, a bit of a no man's land. And it was really only until uh, gold rushes really in the um, you know, late 18, uh, or in late 1900s, um, 1898 and that time period that there was any pressure put on uh, these countries to, to Canada, well, yeah, Canada and the US to, to revisit that notion of border and actually try and incise those borders. Because up until then, 
I mean, that, you know, consistent with this notion of this rolling fog. Uh, people knew they were there, they were on a map, they were imagined, but they weren't on the land. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a minute about, uh, you know, because this occurred in the 20th century, but um, yeah, and I, I would just say, if you, you look East Greenland, Greenland sort of has the same history. It was under control of the Royal uh, Greenlandic Danish Norwegian sort of state entity. And what I think is interesting about that is that it kind of also creates, it's a real boundary between North America and Europe, but it also was a perceptual boundary between North America and Europe because once uh, the company moved in and once effective control of Greenland was, the control of Greenland was affected, um, there were no maritime boundaries established, but that's, so, you know, that was okay for European countries. That didn't matter. We weren't worried about maritime boundaries. There was no law of the sea at that time. Um, might is right, I suppose, this was the rule. But what was very interesting is that division between um, Greenland or Europe and North America, Canada, and the United States was profound. And it didn't, again, Andy said this before, it didn't reflect the reality on the ground, which we'll come back to, is that people were, was a swirling dervish of people going back and forth or across the ice all around the Arctic. And there was no European uh, Arctic in the span of North America that we're thinking of from the Bering Strait to, to Greenland. And we'll continue this in a minute. I, could, I haven't hit the 20th century yet, but I'll stop there. Yes, well, my next question was, uh, what were the most important 20th century events that shaped the North American Arctic borders today? Okay. Also for Heather. So, <laughs> so I get to I get to carry on. And I would say there's there's three things. There's the Arctic Panhandle dispute. There is the uh, development or you know the UNCLUS, um, the codification of the of the law of the sea. And then there's what I simply call, you know, so, so this cooperation, uh, this, this, the rise of Indigenous governance and cooperation. I think those things are fundamental. Now there's other stuff too. I mean, this is just me. Uh, I, I think, you know, anybody would, would say, well, what about this? What about that? There are important details. But the Alaska Panhandle dispute was simply that, it's very important, and I'll explain why in a second, but um, it was simply that the, line that was established by the Russo-American uh, Treaty, which is the normal border you see now between uh, 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 Canada and the United States, wasn't complete. There was a question of where that border, how Alaska was defi defined and divided from um, um, uh, Brit what is now present day British Columbia. And I'm gonna see if I can do a screen share quickly to get that on and I'm not sure how, um, let me just see share. I'm not sure how this is gonna work. Um, this is just giving you a picture of what the evolution of that border looked like. I hope you can see that. Andy, is that on the screen? Okay, a little fuzzy, yeah, but, but here we see this, this border in 1825 that uh, was established by the Russo-American tr um, Treaty. Now that became the 1867 border between Alaska and what was then uh, Canada, newly minted, right? But it didn't deal with this area down here. So I'm gonna try and see if I can go down. Maybe I have to do it this way. Yeah, there we go. So this was the outstanding area. And, and, and what this was, was in 1898-ish, when the, you, know, you have the Klondike gold rush, people are flocking to the Yukon and how are they getting there? You know, they're getting up, the, they're going up the Lynn Canal and then over the pass into the Yukon. Now, Canada maintained um, that this, that they came here. I mean, that, 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 you know, Canada came right down. This was their claim right down to the coast. And Canada said the rest, U.S., we don't contest that. But anything on this side of the line is Canadian. And that gave them water access right up to Skagway. And then the idea was that Canada could control access to the Yukon gold fields. Uh, it was a simple security measure. Um, now, 
when the U.S. said no before the border dispute had ended, when the U.S. denied that, then can the Canadians moved up into the passes uh, and they managed the flow, the, you know, the stories of the heroic mounties on the mountain passes. And then it goes on to you know, the mythic legends of Sam Steele and, you know, the single mountie controlling the Yukon by his force of will. But I mean, these are all myths that come from that. But the RCMP then moved up into the passes and managed the flow inland. But that led to uh, a, a formal dispute that was to be, um, um, you know, resolved by the Herbert Hay um, uh, Treaty uh, in 1903. And the outshot of that arbitration, long story short, is that Britain, lo and behold, sided with the US and said, okay, so if this red line is the Canadian claim, uh, the blue line was the American claim, much more extensive. Right? I'm, so, I'm sorry, if this green line was the Canadian claim, this was the American claim. Britain sided with the Americans, so the Canadians thought, because they didn't get what they wanted. And, and in fact, uh, uh, modern boundary, red, yellow. Okay, there's too many lines here. And in fact, this is what resulted. So you can see that Canada got pushed back not as far back as the US would have liked, but got pushed back, got landlocked. Well, in very technical, you know, border terms, in fact, uh, made them rethink their relationship in many ways. The UK, it was kind of a little red flag, you know, we're on the way, uh, we don't control foreign affairs. I think it substantially changed, you know, the element of trust in some between Canada and the UK. Uh, at the same time, it gave, of course, the US uh, substantial control of the coastline, which is effectively maintained today, so that everything from Yukon that travels comes through, you know, over through ship would either go to the Port of Haines or, or come through this point here, which is Skagway. Um, but I think, and I, I think with this issue, the last thing I want to say about it is I think what Chris Sands said it well when he said it's what you, this really foreshadows in a way is the complexity of Canadian American claims in the Arctic. That is not a simple question of, uh, you know, we got Britain on our side for Canada and uh, we're, we're going to win this thing because we control the Yukon goldfields. It's a much more complex situation that, that will foreshadows the Northwest Passage and, and some other issues that we're going to deal with today. So, so I spent a lot of time on that. And I just want to say that I think the next thing is, of course, the important thing is the UN the declaration, uh, law, uh, the declaration or the codification of the law of the sea, 1892. So that created a framework for, for establishing boundaries. And we can talk a little bit more about what that means in terms of the details and technicalities in different places. But it's incredibly important when you're faced with a situation day of potentially melting ice, changing boundaries, uh, geopolitical pressures. Uh, I think, you know, we go back to uh, the uh, Alulsa agreement, uh, 2008, I believe it was, and then the, it was a Chelsea meeting uh, a little bit after that. But it was really where the five coastal Arctic states said, we have a, a, a law of the sea, we have rules to establish our boundaries, our borders, and we will follow them. So that gave us a framework uh, by which the maritime boundaries could be worked out in the 20th century. And then the last thing I think is simply the uh, rise of indigenous agency and self-governance, because that's seen internal restructuring of, of, of all of these, of these territories. And, um, and you know, Nunavut, the rise of Nunavut, you have the Alaska Native Claim um, Settlement Act. All of these things are really incredibly important. Uh, but they also lead into, and the last thing I'm going to say is they also lead into the agency of Indigenous peoples as international actors. Uh, Canada, for example, is just um, uh, creating domestic law for the, uh, to implement the, under, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That will have territorial and border consequences. Charlie Watts uh, and Hutchins Legal, and there's a, been a whole movement uh, around the continental shelf, uh, you know, the, the process to establish uh, control of the continental shelf. That has had, indeed, uh, for various reasons, Indigenous um, input and agency. And in fact, just to close on this note, um, it's so important that I was, I was in Australia last year at a meeting. We were talking about the Arctic and Antarctic 
somebody said, how does, why does Canada have all these islands? Didn't they belong to Britain? And I said, oh, well, that's because in 1880, Britain trans, and I forgot to tell you that earlier, Britain transferred the Arctic archipelago to Canada without a map, by the way, we had to figure that one out. Um, and one of our major, you know, military, um, uh, um, uh, you know, commanders, uh, I won't name them, but one of our major uh, military uh, uh, power uh, folks in Canada was there and he said, no, he said, no, Heather, Canada has the Arctic archipelago because that's where our, in that was our indigenous people's uh, historical territory. And I think that's an incredible, hasn't had an incredible impact on where we're going. It really is it. There was, a, uh, there was a quick question in the chat. I think we can, ju we can just answer quickly. Um, what was the year that the final yellow border was agreed to? So we talk about the Alaska boundary dispute. What, what years are we talking about, Heather? Sorry, which was the year that what? I missed that. Uh, that the yellow border was agreed to, that the, um, the Alaska boundary dispute was resolved. I think that was, it was 1903. I think that was the agreement year. I mean, it would have taken a while to implement. It was right in that time period because by 1908, you have the uh, International Boundary Commission. Yeah. But somebody might have a better grip on that from the audience and maybe they can just... I knew, I used to know, but I forgot for this meeting. That's okay, close, close enough for rock and roll. Okay. Um, so uh, my next question was, uh, what, about, what about Greenland? How does Greenland fit into that? Hmm. Okay, I'll be very quick on this because we've alluded to this before. Um, Greenland is really part of the North American Arctic. I mean, geologically, you could argue it's an extension of the North American Arctic. Um, let me see, yeah, there we go. Um, can you see that? I'm still on screen share. Yeah. Okay. So, so there it is there. Uh, it's part of the North American Arctic and um, it, uh, Inuit people uh, it, from Greenland have traveled through the Canadian and Alaskan Arctic for uh, uh, since time immemorial. Um, and I think that um, it's part of Greenland is a very important force now. Let's so just shifting away from history. It's very important for us now. The leadership, uh, you know, the Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, has leadership from Canada, Alaska, Greenland, uh, uh, and Greenland um, has been, you know, founding founding the ICC and it's been an important member of the ICC. It is part of the North American North uh, or North American North. I would say it is increasingly looking at its options to, and we'll talk a little bit more, I think of this under trade, uh, I'll mention this more, increasingly looking at its options to connect uh, with Canada. But right now, of course, it is part of Denmark. It is, uh, it is under, you know, it's got uh, effective, uh, some effective autonomy and, 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 and home rule, but it's, it's moving towards more uh, uh, autonomy. And it is effectively um, North American, but technically um, part of Denmark. Great, okay. So now I have a question uh, for myself, which was what do we make of Donald Trump's idea to buy Greenland? Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the book. It's honestly not a huge focus of the, uh, of the book. It's just a, it's kind of a short section. But I wanted to ask myself this question because we're running out of time to criticize the Trump administration. <laughs> it's only about another six weeks, right? So we got to take our chances to get our shots in while we can, right? Um, so Greenland has, of course, achieved home rule, which has given it most of the powers of a, of a state, notably not things like foreign affairs, as Heather said, it remains part of Denmark, but uh, it's kind of in between being a sovereign state and not being a sovereign, sovereign state in a lot of ways. Uh, Greenland, with its small population of just over 56,000 people, relies on Denmark economically. About two-thirds of its annual national budget uh, comes from Denmark. Uh, in response to the suggestion that the United States might purchase Greenland, the Prime Minister of Greenland said, uh, Greenland is not Danish. Greenland is Greenlandic. I've heard this is not something that is seriously meant. Uh, the global politicians in Greenland, for the most part, is independence to some degree. They differ on what that independence looks like, 
but uh, more autonomy for Greenland and the people of Greenland. The goal certainly is not to strengthen or to reimpose colonial rule. Uh, the current Prime Minister of Greenland supports independence, though uh, it's sort of slow independence as it's often referred to. Uh, the United States has an Air Force base in Greenland, so it's an important player in the region. So why does Donald Trump and the Trump administration, why were they potentially interested in purchasing Greenland? Uh, certainly, Possessing the territory of Greenland could help it expand its military presence in the region. It could challenge Russia as a dominant regional player by allowing it to assert a bigger military footprint. The United States could potentially collect royalties on future oil developments in Greenland. Uh, I think, however, that the origin of this idea is just the idea that more land makes you more powerful, that if you want to be a powerful actor in the Arctic region, you should have more territory in the Arctic region which uh, I don't think is a very modern idea in international relations to kind of kind of put it mildly. Uh, if the United States possessed Greenland, it would be the second to largest country in the world. It would leap, leapfrog past Canada, uh, it would still be behind Russia in terms of its land size, but it would be the second largest country in the world. Um, a question I think is, could the United States even effectively govern Greenland? Uh, the United States only has one Arctic icebreaker, for example, it mostly operates in the Antarctic. Uh, the Danish block grants to Greenland is about $600 million per year. So the United States would conceivably be responsible for that in addition to whatever it paid to purchase Greenland, which is a ridiculous idea. And uh, oil development in Greenland has been pretty slow to develop. Um, you know, there's not been big offshore oil production off the coast of Greenland, despite some uh, exploratory permits try and find those resources. So I think the notion that uh, there's going to be such huge um, royalties to collect, it's gonna offset these costs is, uh, is not a very likely one. So, uh, you know, overall it was a ridiculous suggestion from a ridiculous presidential administration. Um, my next question also- so Can I just jump in and say yeah, one yeah. quick thing? Yeah. I Somebody may know the answer here because at the back of my mind, I'm pretty sure that, that there was an offer earlier uh, <laughs> or this was a possibility much earlier. I mean, I'm talking 19th, early 20th century. I know that the U.S. Um, certainly, uh, you know, effectively uh, took... Uh, uh, provided military uh, protection and 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 and, and of, of, of uh, Greenland when Denmark was occupied uh, by Nazi Germany and it all you know established two major bases. But it was my sense that it was even before that that there could have gone right back to when Alaska was purchased from Russia that there was a sense that perhaps Greenland could be purchased and Alaska was seen as not a good idea although. Um, you know, so it's folly, but but it was purchased and to good effect. But somebody from the audience might know that. Yeah, we shall see. Um, so I wanted to change gears a little bit. I wanted to ask about some uh, some modern modern boundary disputes. So I wanted to ask. Um, what about maritime boundary disputes uh, in the Arctic Ocean, particularly around the Lovansov Ridge? Are they an issue of concern? Uh, I'm sure that's. Uh, some of you watching know quite a lot about this issue, have a lot of background. Uh, my take is that they are not an issue of concern and they're not even really boundary disputes, uh, honestly. Uh, part six of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea states that uh, states have the right to exploit resources on their extended continental shelf to a maximum of 350 nautical miles. A resource that a country might exploit on an extended continental shelf would be oil, of course. States map their extended continental shelves and they submit their findings to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, which makes recommendations. Uh, the real challenge in this process is the length of time that this takes to carry out. Um, the time that the Commission takes to make their recommendations is so long that it's possible that new technology will emerge, rendering the earlier research uh, moot. We haven't seen that yet, but that's a possibility. I uh, bring this issue up because sometimes we see this issue framed as a security issue. Pretty regularly, some of the last few weeks, we see uh, op-eds, we see articles describing that this issue is a boundary dispute and that this is evidence that there is conflict and there is tension in the Arctic region. Uh, states, however, do not have the rights to limit ship traffic, for example, in the extended zone. They don't have fishing rights 
that's in the extended zone beyond their exclusive economic zone, uh, what they're working towards is subsurface rights on the extended continental shelf. Uh, we often hear that the Arctic contains 90 billion barrels of oil, but few of those resources are exploitable and are on the extended continental shelves. Most of what is easily exploitable is within current national boundaries. Um, states have been cooperating pretty much perfectly with international law on this matter so far to uh, resolve these issues. So a question that I've had over the years is why are states doing this expensive process to extend the continental shelves? It's relatively unlikely to lead to big oil revenues, and uh, it's, it's not an issue of pressing security. Um, well, you know, certainly this process brings you a certain prestige in certain circles. It's certainly very difficult to do, and it's a scientific feat, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, different things that countries have done, I've heard akin to a space program. So it's certainly a, a scientific accomplishment. There's definitely a link to uh, Arctic culture and the idea of countries being Arctic countries. But I think the most pertinent explanation is from political scientist Elizabeth Riddell Dixon, who says that following this process in the Arctic is important uh, in the Atlantic and the Pacific, where states might be able to find exploitable resources on their extended continental shelves. That if you want to, uh, for the process to carry out in accordance with international law in the Atlantic and Pacific, you have to also follow the same process in the Arctic region. Um, Okay, so the final question I have for myself right now is, uh, what about the Hans Island dispute between Canada and Greenland? Is this an issue of concern? Once again, this is an issue that I'm sure a lot of you have some background in. It's quite an old issue, but nonetheless, it is still an issue that you do read about sometimes in op-eds and in articles describing it as a security issue in the Arctic region. Um, so this answer draws in a our current book, as well as a chapter that I wrote in a uh, another book that Heather edited. Uh, Canada and Denmark both dispute the ownership of Hans Island, which is a one kilometer square piece of land that lies in the Arctic Ocean between Canada's Ellesmere Island and Greenland. In 1973, the governments of Canada and Denmark formally divided the maritime territory between Canada and Greenland, but left the question of Hans Island open. Uh, coastal boundaries around the island are clear, but neither country could produce documentation to show which country possessed the surface of the island. And for 45 years, there's been no resolution to the conflict. But overall, I think that this treaty from 1973 has been very successful. I mean, one kilometer square left over is pretty good, I would say. Um, so does the island contain natural resources? No, the island is uh, basically a rock with no vegetation. Is there historical interest based on human inhabitation? Not really. Humans have never lived on the island. Would possessing the island affect uh, either country's coastal boundaries under the Convention of the Law of the Sea? Uh, no, because that 1973 treaty already divides up all of the available coastal territory around the island. Uh, does this dispute impact international law? Uh, not really. Um, this is a governed under a treaty that separates than the law of the sea, for example. So a precedent here wouldn't necessarily affect other issues. Um, but nonetheless, uh, particularly about 15 years ago or so, this was an issue that was grabbing some headlines. There had been trips to the island to demonstrate sovereignty by both Canadians and Danish officials. Uh, there was a 2002 voyage of a Danish frigate past the island that may or may not have resulted in some troops landing. And there was a visit in July of 2005 by Canada's Minister of Defense, Bill Graham. So I think, you know, this is a kind of a funny dispute in my opinion. In 2010, I interviewed uh, the Canadian Minister of, former Canadian Minister of Defense, Bill Graham about the issue. And I, I published the results of that interview a couple of times. Uh, in our interview, he admitted that his trip to the island in 2005 was, was really a, a political exercise to create intrigue around the dispute as a, a means to win interest and investment in Arctic defense. He said that it was necessary to articulate a certain drama around Arctic sovereignty as a means to place Arctic defense and Arctic issues more generally onto a crowded national agenda. Uh, he didn't characterize in our discussion the issue over sovereignty on the island as innately important. Uh, he stated that he, he was supportive of the idea of Canada and Greenland sharing the islands though with some equivocations. Um, but nonetheless, I would not say that this is a, an issue of great concern 
uh, in border in border management. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop talking for a can little I, bit. Can I add something, Andy? I know I wasn't in yes. there. I just wanted to say quickly that I think you've put that so well, and I think that you can we can weigh partly because I forgot to say this earlier. You can weigh the Hans Island um, question of of, of firm boundaries against the, uh, and I'm, I know I'm not going to say it right, the Pikiosauric uh, Polenia issue um, that uh, Canada and, and Greenland are looking to, or, or Greenland slash Denmark are looking to um, develop more um, of a um, uh, sort of sharing arrangement. Uh, and also that Canada and, and, and Greenland slash Denmark are also looking to uh, better facilitate and work together to build, facilitate mobility and movement uh, uh, under, you know, under different uh, structures uh, because of the close relationship with Inuit in, in both areas. So, so that is a little bit of a rider over the, uh, um, also we think of Hans Island and, and, and maritime boundaries, but then we have behind the scenes these other issues going on. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just a note for my, for my fellow panelists, I think I'm gonna skip over our next couple of questions because we've heard, we haven't heard too much from Karen so far. And I'm just looking at the time. So we want to, uh, we want to talk about the economy. We wanna talk about uh, what Karen contributed to the book. So uh, I have a question. I'm going to start with Heather, and then I'll, I'll throw to throw to Karen, and then I have several questions that are for Karen. Um, so, uh, what effect does the perception of the Arctic being a resource-rich region have on regional border management? And I think that goes with the previous two questions too. So, what is the effect of that of that idea? So, Heather, and then we'll go to Karen. I'm going to say not a whole lot um, on regional border management. Um, and we can talk a little bit when we get to the notion of what the uh, maybe what some of the challenges are for for border management. Um, you know, it's just under it's, it's, it's landlocked and it's under re, the borders landlocked and under resourced. So the, um, um, it's not international borders so much that we're crossing uh, in terms of resource management. Uh, if you're thinking a uh, resource, you know, import and export. If you're thinking of of development, then of course the Arctic is a big a big context of, as, as a as a region which draws you know tremendous uh, interest from international uh, um, you know corporations, transnational corporations. Uh, that's extremely important, and and not to take away because I want to give Karen because she's much more well much better versed in this uh, but I think that we forget sometimes that there's this perception that a resource rich area means that things are popping up every day and you know there's tremendous activity and flurry of people running around and big trucks moving and you know these the reality is that even a resource rich area it takes so long and so much money uh, that uh, and so many regulations that um, it, it just means movement, paced movement over time that could be carefully managed to create regional development rather than international companies popping in all over the place uh, and you know challenging border integrity. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to let Karen take it from here. Great, thanks. So um, I agree with Heather that I think um, in terms of border management, there isn't um, a huge impact on how uh, the resource development or the region being resource rich will affect border management. But what comes to mind is that um, if we're looking at extractive resources, they generally leave the region. Um, so there will be perhaps some customs issues leaving the region or more importantly, more importantly, I think is the associated risk that comes with say maritime transit. Uh, and the possibility of environmental disasters or pollution, these risks will increase with it. And I guess the other way to also look at it is um, uh, the, the boundaries themselves, and Andy, as you, as you mentioned with the UNCLOS process for the extended continental shelf. So there is the potential for that, but those claims I believe have all been submitted for now. So we're just waiting to see. And as you said, there's not too much um, you know, the big gain for the resources aren't that far out. So it's, there'll be that boundary delimitation, but in terms of the border management and other aspects that come along with it, um, I don't think, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's a, a huge consideration for border management when we think of border management in traditional terms. Yeah, great. Um, so following up on that, but changing gears a little bit, uh, we'll start with Karen. Uh, what is the current situation around cross-border trade in the North American Arctic today? 
Great, sorry, I had a problem unmuting there. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I'm gonna take Canada as my focal point because that's where my research has been on. And so for looking at the three Canadian territories, um, they all do a fair amount of merchandise trade at the global level, um, like in the hundreds of millions of dollars range. So it's, it's a sizable sum. But when we look at their trade with other Arctic states, it's not there as much. So when we're looking at trade within the circumpolar Arctic, um, those values are quite low actually. Um, but then we look at the North American Arctic, um, there's a little bit of a different picture there. And, and so generally speaking, if we look at Yukon, um, Yukon does most of their trade with the US and Alaska. The Northwest Territories does some trade with the US um, overall, but very minimal amounts with Alaska. And this is a pattern that exists. You can see these on the trade statistics for, you know, like five year patterns. And, um, and Nunavut uh, does a little bit of trade with the US and in some years they actually don't do any trade with Alaska either. And Nunavut is the usually the only territory that actually does uh, trade with Greenland but the dollar value is actually quite low. So exports are often under $10,000, while imports can be anywhere around 25, up to 25,000 annually. And, um, and it's also important to keep in mind that the value of trade can change from year to year. And in some years, um, there might not be any trade between the territories of Alaska or Greenland, but overall, these are, um, these are some patterns that exist over the past five or six years. If I could just jump in, I, I, that's okay. I just wanted to say a couple of, you know, one of the interesting things about COVID um, was in fact, you know, we hadn't, maybe I'll just talk quickly about the edges there in terms of Alaska and say something about Greenland, but um, you know, Alaska's uh, commercial fisheries are just enormous, right? And um, that was one of the impacts of, uh, I understood of COVID-19 uh, of COVID was the, uh, there was worry about what was going to happen to the uh, in-migration And the boats uh, during the fishing fishing season. So COVID was a was a real you know worry uh, in that sense. And it also the other thing about COVID, by the way, is that um, I'm pretty sure this is true in the Canadian North as well, well as in Alaska. That because uh, it was difficult to move goods because in many cases passenger flights were also moving cargo in much of the remote north. And uh, when people weren't moving, uh, airlines weren't moving, some airlines went bankrupt or, or you know, really bottomed out. And so that there was a, there certainly was a problem in other areas of moving uh, freight and cargo around. So, I mean, those are, uh, you know, border related issues. I guess I might want to just say quickly about Greenland. Um, I think that what's interesting about about Greenland is again, it's 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 a changing Greenland's in terms of potential, um, and maybe we'll get into this with geopolitics if we get that we actually get there today, um, that, um, you know, with relations between uh, US and China, and US and Canada too, uh, deteriorating, and the role of China in providing, say, rare, uh, you know, rare earth um, um, minerals for, uh, for the US markets, about 80% uh, of rare earth compounds and metals come from China. Greenland's opening up that market and, um, or is, you know, I don't want to overstate it, but that market is opening, that, that resource is beginning to open in Greenland. Greenland is becoming a, a site that a lot of people are interested in, in investing uh, in. And even in terms of tourism, that's changing as well. So that while tourism to a large extent is more European, there's a, there is a large American component to that. Um, there is potential for uh, resource, uh, you know, flows of resources, particularly rare earths. And then there's the energy question as well. Um, so all in all, Greenland's poet poised to be much more global. And, you know, airports development and all kinds of infrastructure that's happening. Uh, Greenland's poised to become much more, more global and engaged in the resource sector, tourism and, and energy trade, I think. Um, and uh, I think this connectivity will likely find its way as north to north exchanges. But Greenland's also looking to St. John's, Newfoundland as its north connection. We, we think it would be Nunavut. It's actually, that's the largest major American, North American port. So there's, there's th those, there's change in, in, in the wind here. 
fortune. Um, one of the things you talk about in what you wrote in the book is this uh, Beyond the Border Management Program. So can you tell us about what the Beyond the Border Management Program is and what it tried to accomplish? Yeah, so uh, Beyond the Border, it was an action plan that came into effect uh, near the end of 2011. And it was a way for Canada and the United States to bilaterally improve um, their border management and the cross-border flows between the two countries. So the plan had four key areas. Uh, the first was to address threats early. So basically it's about stopping threats before they come to North America, before they come to our borders. The second was the improvement of trade facilitation, economic growth, and jobs. And there was a focus there on um, some of the priorities were on pre-inspection and pre-clearance um, and border fees. So these cross-border flows could move uh, much faster across the border. So when we think of trade quarters, you know, you think of Windsor and Detroit, and you've got those huge lines where the trucks are just waiting, right? So it, it's something that would help move these types of flows across the border. Um, you know, faster and more efficiently. Uh, the third component was uh, cross-border law enforcement. So that would be improving bilateral enforcement to address um, shared security concerns or enforcement concerns. And the fourth component was critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. And that was working together to protect shared infrastructure. And it also includes addressing disaster management along the border. So the plan, uh, it listed a number of pilot projects, but none were actually designed to take place in the north. Um, so the plan itself is very heavily focused in the south along, you know, the 49th parallel, uh, so to speak. And as well, certain uh, components of the action plan actually don't always apply to the north, right? So if we're thinking about pre-clearance, uh, sure, there are trucks and, and shipments that go across the, the border with Alaska, but the volumes aren't as high and you, you won't have that huge lineup of trucks trying to get across either way. So a lot of times that these programs don't necessarily apply to what's going on in the North. And uh, we also, the 2016 Auditor General Report actually also found um, that in general, many of the challenges, there's, some, sorry, there's been some challenges around implementing the trade provisions um, in such a way to actually move these trade flows. So. Well, it, it's great because it sets up um, a shared understanding about how the borders to be managed and some guidelines on what to do. Um, it hasn't it hasn't fixed everything, and of course, the north um, it doesn't necessarily apply to the north. So there needs to be some other innovative solutions that way. Great. So I'm thinking um, we said we wanted to be finished at twelve thirty. So I'm thinking we'll talk for about another. 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to some questions. Um, if that's agreeable, Heather, Karen, does that sound, sound good? Yeah, I think people are interested in the climate. We've had a question about climate change. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely, we'll definitely uh, answer that question. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll ask Karen one more question. I have two more for Karen. I'm just deciding which one's better. Um, let's talk about uh, maybe migrants. We'll talk about the one about migrants. Um, how does the current border regime in the North American Arctic facilitate the flow of migrants across national boundaries? Great, so that's also a good question. So thanks for asking. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to look at the flows of migrants um, in the North or in the North American Arctic. So the first is in relation to economic needs. Uh, there can be labor shortages in the region that need to be filled. So we can see this with fly in, fly out workers from the South. Many times there it's domestic migration. Um, it's not necessarily a border management issue per se in terms of um, having to do the security checks on people coming in. But we are also seeing that many companies in the North will also uh, fill some shortages through um, international workers. And so in Canada, for example, there's the territorial nomination program, uh, which can be used to fill the vacancies. And so the territory itself has the responsibility of approving the people um, for these programs. But then we also see that there's this doesn't uh, take away from the federal responsibility around the security checks and deeming who's admissible and who's inadmissible to the country under the national laws. Um, but you know we aren't seeing um, high numbers of in inadmissible people to the north anyway, so it's not so much of a concern. 
And the second aspect about um, migration in North, the North American Arctic is about, I would say it's about the uh, cross-border flows of indigenous peoples. So as Heather mentioned earlier, uh, borders have divided communities and we see that along the Alaska Yukon border and as well between Inuit Ninigat and Greenland. Um, so currently these flows of people must follow existing war management policies and rules and procedures, you know, which can be challenging because not everyone has a passport or access to get a passport. Um, but we've seen in uh, Canada's new Arctic and Northern policy framework, which was released just over a year ago, and as Heather mentioned earlier, um, uh, the Canadian federal government is willing, not willing, but it, they will work uh, to facilitate these kind of these cross border flows. But if we read the AMPF, um, it, it doesn't exactly say what this is going to look like um, and how it's going to be done. But and well, and there's also no time frame to it, so it's it's all still up in the air. But um, because the AMPF is the co-developed with indi Indigenous peoples. Um, I'm very optimistic that it will be done in such a way that is um, respectful of everybody and will accommodate everybody's needs and requirements while still also maintaining national security and stuff. It's a hard process to, to do, but um, I'm optimistic that something something good will come from that. Can I, can I just jump in if, if Karen's on? I just want to say one quick thing um, that we've talked about as a group, but um, is the, the differential application of the Jay Treaty uh, between Canada and the US. And this is a big issue in the, in certainly in the Arctic where, or the, you know, the North American North where, where there are indigenous, particularly around the borderlands areas, it's, it's, it's quite indigenous. And, and um, the US of course respects the, the Jay Treaty, uh, which allow, which basically says, you know, a North American Indian is a North American an Indian, a Canadian Indian, Canadian Indian, and I'm using that language um, that fits the, uh, the treaty, is a North American Indian and passes freely. What Canada doesn't respect or doesn't recognize, I should say, the Jay Treaty. And so an Indigenous person crossing from Alaska to Canada doesn't have the same rights. And that's been a problem that the Canadian government too has been the Karen report and a number of people have looked at. And I was speaking to CBSA yesterday, uh, a, a, a person there said that, you know, what's what's happening is, we're, well, maybe we'll see what the J Treaty, but certainly there is a whole new spectrum of, 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 of uh, policies and ways of dealing with Indigenous communities that are intersected or crossed by the border being rolled out. So that's kind of interesting. But the J Treaty is really, really critical there too. Great. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll ask one more question before we open it up. And I'm going to ask myself this question, which is the advantage of, uh, of asking the questions. You can you can decide to give yourself the final word. So I, I wanted to ask about um, the Arctic Council and how it contributes to border management in the Arctic region. And partly I want to answer this question because the Arctic Council is uh, my major area of research. And so every uh, public talk I've given, I've mentioned the Arctic Council, so I can't break precedent right now and not talk about it at all. Um, so how does the Arctic Council contribute to border management in the Arctic region? Um, for those who maybe don't know, the Arctic Council is the international institution for the Arctic uh, region. It's made up of all of the uh, Arctic states, as well as six Indigenous peoples organizations. It's kind of like the European Union for the Arctic, though much, 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 much less powerful than the European Union. Um, so the Arctic Council, you might think, would be a, a natural venue to uh, provide border governance and border management, settle some of these uh, these issues. Um, not as not as active as you might think. Uh, its mandate is not limited to, but emphasizes environmental protection and sustainable development. So the Arctic Council has done work on uh, transboundary pollution, but that's not quite what we're talking about right now. Um, it's not been the venue to provide governance around the extended continental shelf um, mapping, for example. It's not the type of um, type of uh, um, venue where you would negotiate something like the, the Beyond the Border program or something like that. Um, but notably, it has served as a venue to create two international agreements that have an impact on boundaries. Uh, they created a 2011 agreement on search and rescue cooperation and a 2013 agreement about responding to oil spills. Uh, the agreements basically set out that in the event of an emergency, states will take care of certain zones of responsibility, and it creates boundaries for these zones, though the agreements note that the boundaries don't exist 
outside of the agreements. So say explicitly that uh, the boundaries created in the agreements don't have an impact on something like extended continental shelves or maritime boundaries. Uh, the agreements also set out that states will cooperate to respond to emergencies if circumstances dictate. Um, what's interesting about those agreements is that for the people I've spoken to, they say that the most noteworthy um, parts of the agreement is that it compiled, they compile contacts in case of emergency. If there's a search and rescue emergency and Russia should respond, it establishes who Canada calls in Russia to make sure that happens. Um, so I think that's a little bit funny. Uh, you have an international agreement. They're, they're not technically treaties, but they're, they're basically treaties in a lot of ways. Um, creating kind of a phone tree doesn't seem like the most ambitious thing that you can do. But I've spoken to some pretty high level Canadian officials who were not overly familiar with a lot of the details of these agreements, but definitely knew about the contacts they established. So it seems like that's really the significant thing. Um, but nonetheless, I find it really interesting whenever you have multiple sets of boundaries operating on top of one another. And here we have an example where we do have different boundaries existing. We have these zones of responsibilities that are different from coastal boundaries established by the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, for example. Um, okay, so with that, we have uh, some questions rolling in, I think. I see a bunch of stuff here in the chat. I haven't really been looking at it. Um, but uh, Victoria, perhaps do you want to uh, do you want to ask some questions from the from the from the from the audience? Sure. Well, first, thank you. A virtual round of applause for mm -hmm. a really robust and um, you know a a cover a lot of ground question and answer. Uh, I was quite impressed by how many questions you asked and answered. Um, we have a few questions that are coming in. Um, and please, if you would like to ask a question, type that in the chat, or you can go over to the participant icon at the bottom of your screen and click to raise your hand if you would like to come on video or audio to ask yourself. So we have a question from Jack uh, asking, what is the status of dispute over location of maritime boundary between Yukon and Alaska in the Beaufort Sea? Andy, do I don't you do that one? Do you want to? Yeah, I believe, uh, I believe uh, still pending. It's one of those issues that you, you might think would be relatively easy to resolve. Those issues that, um, um, you know, uh, um, you might be able to, to resolve fairly quickly. That might be important symbolically about the strength of Canadian American relations, but uh, have not, have not uh, seen a lot of developments uh, in addressing that issue in recent years. It's not been, not been really top of, top of mind in um, regional governance, especially. Um, so yeah, I don't really have any, any grand updates there. Heather, do you have any, do you have any insights oh. there, Karen? I would just say, you know, you have the Beaufort Sea Partnership. So a lot of the work, you know, uh, the tricky work is done at the level of environmental cooperation. And I think the Beaufort Sea, again, um, there's an author, an author in the book, Justin Barnes, who wrote a sustainability chapter with me. And he, this is much more his thing. But um, yeah, there's, there, is, there are cooperations or other ways in which um, that, um, because, because there's a... Um, um, a commonality of culture and way of life that that border um, needs to kind of be seamless. You've got the Inuvit land settlement. Um, there are technically um, requirements um, that come under that for certain, you know, for for access to offshore and you know waters. I'll just sort of leave it there because it gets pretty complicated. But but um, the land claims, you know. Sets one sets of one set of uh, requirements up there, but these these regional cooperations are 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 are, are I think more important at this point. I, I mean, there will always be the geopolitics and the 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 hard uh, boundary issues, but um, as Andy said, they're not bubbling over at this point. Yeah, I mean, there are like, there are issues that. To me, like there, there's a lot of complication, as you say, Heather. But uh, if there was political will, I think they could be resolved fairly quickly. And the Hans Island dispute is another example, but it doesn't seem it doesn't seem top of mind. 
we have another question uh, about if Western Greenland has an airport. Uh, Andy or Heather or Karen mentioned that there will be trade between St. John in Newfoundland and Greenland. Um, and maybe talk a bit about uh, that potential trade and transportation routes. Um. Well, there are, I mean, there are airports all around Greenland, um, but there was discussion at Nuuk of, of redoing the international airport. It's a little, it's a short runway um, and um, they don't use the same kind of radar technology that, that you use, you know, that other airports use, which means that you get fogged in a lot. And, um, you know, there's nothing, actually nothing more pleasant than being fogged in a nuke for a few days. You get to know people at the airport. Um, so there is a need to re to reconfigure that airport to make it serviceable, you know, all weather and and and, and larger, you know, jet and cargo. Um, and that uh, that would come from investment. And where that investment is, I gather where that investment is coming from has been um, debated. I mean, at one point there was talk of Chinese investment in, in the airport, and I don't think that that, I was going to say, I don't think that flew, but I, I'm not entirely, bad pun, and I'm not quite up on that. Um, and again, the, the St. John uh, Greenland is, is, is so discussions I've had with, with some of the diplomats in, 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 in uh, Greenland who, um, as you know, the uh, diplomatic representation from Greenland, not Denmark, but Greenland was extended to Canada not that long ago. And um, so I think these are, these are potential plans. And I would wonder if they would be worked on, Andy, and the Arctic Economic Council, which is a sort of a corollary or a, a cousin of the Arctic Economic Council that deals with shipping and, and, and that sort of thing. So look at the Arctic International Arctic Economic Council. Look that up after today, as well as the Arctic Council. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we can link to that in our follow-up email too for all of you to check out. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a question oh, from Paul. Sorry. I'm sorry, just somebody just just typed in and trying to interrupt you. It says, uh, this is from Renault. Uh, the Chinese did the cheapest bid for the Greenland airport upgrade, which forced Denmark to step in and carry the financial burden itself, pressed by NATO. This was in 2018. So there's the, the recent status. I apologize. Thank you for that update. Um, we have a question from Pablo on what will the global impacts of climate change be on Arctic borders? Uh, I guess I'll start, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things about climate change, obviously, is that the Arctic waters are becoming more accessible each year. Um, so it's, they're more accessible, but they're more navigable. So from, from a border management perspective, in terms of security and safety, um, there's, new, there's new and emerging regional considerations with this, um, especially around safety. Um, so we're seeing things like we're going to have more issues around search and rescue, pollution, and from a border management perspective, there are a lot, um, states will need to be able to enforce their own laws and rules within the region. So if we think about, say, the Canadian Arctic, we've got the Arctic Waters Protection, Pollution and Protection Act, AWAPA, and Nordreg, which are, uh, designed, um, to, uh, minimize or eliminate, or not, because you can't eliminate, but designed to um, reduce the potential for environmental disasters or environmental risk. And with Nordreg, um, I think it's all vessels under 300 tons have to report in, get authorization to transit through the waters. Um, but if, say, Canada is not able to enforce its own laws, there's, there could be um, increased risk this way and some other management issues. So, um, so one way or one issue is it's about risk management and enforcement capabilities. Okay. Andy, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, had, I had a question about this actually, but uh, I've seen some debate recently about what is the big issue in the Arctic in terms of borders or the region more generally. I've seen a bunch of op-eds that argue that rising tension with China and Russia is a big threat in the North American Arctic, uh, the arms buildup um, or investment in the military, if you wanna be uh, um, more positive, uh, by these two countries is challenging Canada and the United States 
uh, in particular in the North American Arctic. But uh, I'm 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 not on that on that side. Just recently, uh, Michael Mann, the world famous climatologist, said that climate change is the biggest threat to the Arctic today, and I think that's. It's pretty clear. It's uh, it's climate change is the profound issue, and all these issues that we're talking about really, really come down to to climate change to some extent. Yeah, I think uh, I mean in terms of boundaries, Karen is is totally right. So um, safety and changes in sea ice conditions and more ship traffic and um, developing regulations um, are going to create potentially uh, more search and rescue emergencies. Uh, the Arctic um, Search and Rescue, Arctic Council's Search and Rescue Agreements plays parts of the role in responding to those because it creates the framework for cooperation. Um, but it's certainly not the not the end of that. And states, all of the states in the North American Arctic are investing in expanding uh, their search and rescue capabilities. Um, so that's uh, that's really a, really a big, big area of focus in terms of uh, Border management um, and uh, in response to climate change on the part of the of the Arctic states. Um, there's more to say, but uh, Heather. Yeah. So I just you know that kind of takes me to where I want to go with this, which is that um, those of you who join us from Alaska will have heard of the Arctic or the um, Arctic Domain Awareness Awareness Center at University of Alaska Anchorage, and I've had you know the pleasure of working with Church and uh, Church Key and and Doug Causey uh, on some projects. And what's fascinating is we'll, 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 with climate change, what's happened um, is that there has been. Uh, Recognition that, of course, non-conventional threats and 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 the biggest threat will be climate. Uh, you know, the biggest things that you have to understand. You have to understand meteor meteorology perhaps more than you have to understand someone else's strategic assets, or equally so. Anyway, we won't make one more important than the other. But but um, and so with that comes you know domain awareness, understanding how your immediate environment impacts your security situation. Um, this has pushed uh, certainly, I think, all northern state governments of all northern states. But uh, I'll talk about Canada and the U.S. in particular. It's pushed them not only to be more mindful of the impact uh, of the fact that climate change will not only affect their operations, but will affect community operations and community security. So going there is changing a little bit the definition of traditional security and how it operates. And part of that, you know, to make a short story long, part of that is actually the fact that in order to work effectively against climate change, um, in terms of you know operational security operators in the in the north have to work in a transnational capacity, have to work together. Um, the closest person needs to be able to go. Uh, and um, there are so many problems of resourcing, so many problems of capacity that these things have to be seamless. And there's been a tremendous amount of work, um, the CANUS workshops uh, that are going on uh, at, the, uh, at ADAC, the Arctic Domain Awareness Center, uh, bringing in uh, and having discussions between not just military, but I mean, there's policing, there's Coast Guard, all of these different actors and, you know, interagency uh, response and transnational. So pushing that border down and, and you know, bringing up the coordinated environmental um, response. And that's it. That's all she wrote. <laughs> And for those of you who are interested in climate impacts in the Arctic generally, I would encourage you to look back at past webinar recordings where we talk about diseases moving north, permafrost degradation, climate-induced relocation, disaster risk management, uh, and fisheries moving north. Uh, and we will be sharing the link to those recordings also in the follow-up. Um, but for now, I'm going to ask a uh, double header question from Patty and then Paul. So Patty would like to know, wouldn't it be more difficult to work on the border between Alaska and Yukon due to native claims and native nations? And Paul's question is, are indigenous peoples pushing for sovereignty over more areas? Hmm. I, I just have a quick question. Maybe Patty could put it in chat. I'm not quite sure what what you mean by work. Um, do you mean like for government people to work in that area, work across, or for governments to work on the policies on that border? I, I'm just not quite sure. So maybe we could answer the next question, and Patty could put that in 
that into the chat box. Sure, so, and maybe okay. I'll, oh, Patty's coming on. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was thinking more about um, the native claims. I'm in Michigan, so mm -hmm. the native claims, let's say in Lake Superior, um, where it is um, through the native nations, they have every right in the world to do whatever they're doing as far as fishing goes. Mm -hmm. And there's always a conflict with folks. So when you were talking about the areas off of the Yukon, and um, Alaska, do those claims or have, and I'm not familiar with any treaties in those areas, have an impact as to how they are working to solve any of those border issues in the, in the Arctic waters. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, I would say uh, Anuvilit because, and I, you know, I don't want to get too, partly because I, unless it's written in front of me, I, I, I don't want to misspeak, but, but because there are, are, are specifications in that um, land claim uh, about access to coastal waters that are, would be, that haven't been negotiated um, with the U.S. And so that because there is the, the boundary isn't isn't determined there so that uh, that that there are there are issues in that land let's put it that way that that are important um there are issues the white river group who i'm a little bit more familiar with beaver in the beaver creek area uh have had a <laughs> It's a long story, an interesting story. I read Norm Easton's work about the little book that went missing that guaranteed them access to both sides of the border that I think Rayburn uh, wrote the note in the book uh, that they could always cross the border and that went missing. And that's had a tremendous impact. Um, and for the CVSA, all I can say is it's a little bit different in the Yukon in terms of umbrella agreements and they're a little bit different sometimes than territorial boundaries. Uh, but the CBSA said to me the other day, again, I won't say who, but said, you know, we didn't treat the White River Group, their indigenous community. Um, we didn't treat them like they were one of our communities. We just treated them as something else. And she said, all of a sudden, when you realize these are our community, these are us, our communities, we, we, we've restructured how we, we don't have to change the law. We just have to go in and, 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 and talk to people like we would talk to people in our community that we want to understand things. So, um, but you're right, land claims and, 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 and Nunavut land claims, and that gives, in a sense, it's really complicated, but this is where Inuit claim to help, you know, being having a right to determine Canada's continental shelf also comes from that as well. I don't know if Andy or Karen, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll maybe answer the, that and then also the, the second question. I mean, I think the answer is, uh, is definitely yes to Indigenous peoples pushing for, for more sovereignty, uh, self-determination. I think that's uh, definitely a dynamic you see across the entire Arctic region, not only in terms of borders or boundaries, but uh, in, an overall, in an overall way. I mean, in Canada, self-government agreements across the Arctic are still being negotiated, or have, yes, they're right there. In New Vialet, there's a land claim agreement in effect, but the self-government agreement is still uh, under negotiation. Um, so one example in terms of, in terms of borders is uh, the Canada-Greenland border. Um, the uh, National Inuit Organization, ITK, and I, I believe also the Inuit Circuit Court Council has expressed support for a kind of J Treaty-like agreement uh, across the Canada-Greenland border, which to me seems like something that once again would be pretty easy to do with pretty minimal security issues or um, uh, you know, concerns about uh, border integrity, but we've not seen a lot of political will on. But that's an example where, um, yeah, I think that with uh, uh, greater greater recognition of historical territories, greater self determination is is sought, and uh, yeah, not not an issue that is resolved. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's no overlapping. I, I mean, and partly to come back to that, um, what Annie was saying, but but bear in mind there aren't any overlapping 
claims? I mean, the Alaska Native Land Settlement claim doesn't extend into Canada. Uh, that the borders, the border took care of that. It it it, def, it divided. There's there's sort of buffer zones. There's you know these 20, 30 kilometer zones between border posts that are a little bit problematic. But but the the international border serves as an international border and. The only thing is that in the US, Canadians have much better access. Canadian Indigenous peoples have access to Alaska to live there, to, um, you know, to work there in ways that uh, Americans don't have in Canada. Okay, thanks. And I'd just like to add one thing about the question about sovereignty. Um, so with, for example, Canada's uh, new Arctic a northern policy framework. There was the federal chapters, which was the main chapter. There's an international chapter and a security chapter. But where um, this policy was different was with the co-development with uh, northern partners, which included mm -hmm. the territories as well as indigenous peoples. So um, there's four partner chapters. Um, there's a pan-territorial chapter between Yukon, the governments of Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. And then the governments of Northwest Territories and Nunavut have their own partner chapters. But then there's the fourth one, which is an Inuit uh, partnership with a chapter with the ITK. And I don't want to misspeak on what is written there, but I will just say you should check it out. They are very clear about their position, um, where they see themselves in the North within the, can the Canadian framework. And it's, um, it's a very good document that should be checked out for sure. Thank you. We are just about at time, but we have one more question to answer from the chat uh, from Gray, who would like to know, within these disputed borders, have countries established heavily invested in settlements to be used as tools to establish territory? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, who would like to go? <laughs> Well, I mean, historically, the answer is uh, is uh, definitely yes. Uh, I'm thinking of the the high Arctic exiles. Can you, can you can you speak about that a little bit, uh, Heather? Pardon me, the high. Yeah, the, the high Arctic exiles. Like, yeah, uh, the high Arctic. Yeah, ocean. yeah. Can you, I, I believe that's in your mm -hmm. material. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the high the uh, the high Arctic sort of relocation was moving uh, Inuit folks from uh, Port Harrison, what it was called at the time, Port Harrison, which is northern Quebec up to a series, you know, a, a, a Grease Ford uh, and Pond Inlet and, and, and Ellesmere Island. And it was uh, during the 1950s and early, yeah, 1950s. Um, and uh, there was a feeling then as Canada was sort of moving to be more of an Arctic, um, um, to assert its Arctic sovereignty. I mean, sovereignty is a theme that runs through Canadian Arctic discussion for decades. So to assert sovereignty, it felt that people were needed. There were all kinds of reasons and challenges in terms of the geopolitical context. People were needed in the North. And, the, and it was like, oh, well, let's just take some Inuit folks a little further south and put them up North, no problem. And of course it was, it, it was a, a, a disastrous in the sense that it moved people from one Arctic environment to another. It impacted on, on people's lives that moved. Uh, Inuit went, uh, lived with uh, on RCMP posts or just outside, you know, in conjunction with RCMP posts. Some of them never returned, never saw their family again. That was done. Um, and there's a lot of stuff written on that. Sheila Grant and Marcus Allen out in the cold. Uh, it's worth reading. Um, there will be other areas. I think Norway had a, a, a um, there were a couple of, uh, Norway in Denmark there's a Denmark in Greenland there's been with this when Norway and Denmark were disputing territories there were some settlements and some activities going on to assert sovereignty in which uh, Denmark eventually prevailed over Norway. Uh, the Alaskan situation, well, of course, the Russians, <laughs> when they settled on Kodiak Island way, way, way back and um, then effective, I think, homesteading, moving people to homestead in Alaska um, before it became a state. That, those would be my suggestions that they were all of a, not necessarily all to exert sovereignty, but they were all to create presence on the way to creating a stronger political entity, whether it was the state of Alaska or Canada's claim you know, to islands in the high Arctic.
Thank you. And I think we have gotten to everyone's questions. Uh, so I would like to again give a huge round of applause to our incredible presenters. Thank you, Heather, Andrew, and Karen for a really meaningful discussion, for answering so many diverse questions that we got, and to being open and engaged in these critical issues of Arctic borders. Uh, I hope that this is the the start of more meaningful conversations in our research coordination network, virtually in the short term and in person in Alaska, in Sweden, and in Washington, DC uh, in the years to come. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next webinar in January 2021. Until then, I hope everyone has a safe, a healthy and a happy holiday season.